episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to this second show in as many hours on Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And uh, today is no exception to that rule. In fact, we are probably going to top ourselves in uh, the best guest category. I'm going to mention this off the top, but then I will mention it again later. Uh, tomorrow's a big show for Surviving the Survivor. Tomorrow's 7 p.m. Eastern time. We are welcoming back Josh and Sandy Greenberg, and this time their attorney, uh, we, who we have not heard uh, from, who has some, uh, as they say in news, bombshell allegations related to this case. Um, Ellen Greenberg was a school teacher in Philadelphia back in 2011. She was engaged to a guy named Sam Goldberg. Uh, it's a nor'easter that is coming through at the time, a uh, massive snowstorm, and uh, she is... Uh, discovered uh, stabbed to death 20 times, 20 stab wounds, 10 to the front, but 10 to the back of her head and back of her neck up in positions you can't really get to, uh, especially once you're deceased because an independent autopsy found that two of the wounds were inflicted post-mortem. Uh, this case unbelievably has never, ever been investigated. Uh, there's a killer on the loose and uh, there was a crazy amount of cover-up. Uh, the case was, uh, the scene was cleaned professionally. Laptops were taken by the fiance's uncle, who is a, uh, uh, in a position, high judicial uh, position as a judge in the Phil Philadelphia area. Uh, and this uh, case um, goes all the way up uh, the ranks, all the way, even involving the current governor, Josh Shapiro. So please show support tomorrow night, not to me, not to the COE. Uh, but to the Greenberg family, uh, I know it'll be important to them as we work. Uh, there's some some big movement in the case, and we need to get a um, we need to get you know, obvious cover up is right, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Um, I did have a protein bar, so thanks for thinking of me, MJ. But I will get through this show, come hell or high water. Now, uh, this story is just bonkers. The one we're doing today, uh, the search for two Oklahoma moms sadly came to a uh, screeching halt with the arrest of four um, un untoured looking, unkempt looking people. Uh, and of course, after the discovery of two bodies, uh, which were confirmed to be uh, those of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, Grandma Tiffany Adams, the grandmother of Veronica Butler's uh, ch uh, children, uh, she's arrested along with her boyfriend, Tad Cullum, and Cole and Cora Twombly all arraigned today in criminal court in Texas County, Oklahoma. Uh, best guest today, here, right now, uh, the best of the best when it comes to uh, this um, famed Tallahassee defense attorney, R. Timothy Jansen. He's a partner in the firm Jansen and Davis. He's done it all, murder cases, criminal cases, uh, all sorts of things, including five years as a federal prosecutor in both Tampa and Tallahassee. And then in the green shirt with the beautiful grandfather clock, um, a veteran investigator, Steve Peterson, who has covered this case for us. He's a senior, uh, was a senior special agent, otherwise known as an SSA of the DEA with all the acronyms. He was with the Drug Enforcement uh, Agency. He was the uh, longest working street agent at the time of his retirement. He put away the real Walter White from Breaking Bad. And last, but certainly not least, we've got Dr. Michaela Sar Saramosing joining us back. Uh, she is the owner of the largest Oklahoma-owned private investigation agency, and uh, she's got some uh, sources uh, close to this case. So um, first off, uh, Tim Jansen, for those who do not know, and not everyone knows, uh, they were arraigned today, these suspects. What does that mean in uh, layman's terms? Well, they're brought before the court. The charges are read. They're informed of what the charges are. And then they appoint them lawyers. If they have a lawyer, they can't afford a lawyer, they'll appoint them a lawyer. Uh, and then they usually will consider bond situations at that time. Um, that's basically informing them what the official charges are about it. And it starts the process of the court. 
There you go. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the triple Q format uh, in the chat. I'll be scrolling down uh, three amazing experts uh, to pick their brain about this really heinous and horrible crime. You see them here. That's Grandma Tiffany on the top left. Uh, all of them uh, with the vests on. The guy top right, I still can't get over it, 43 years old. Um, and then bottom left is uh, Cole Twombly and his wife to the right, Cora Twombly. And as you can see, all except for Cora are in their uh, orange and white uh, striped jumpsuits with those vests for extra protection because uh, they are uh, not very well liked in this particular area. Uh, Tim Jansen, back to you on this. Uh, the most mm -hmm. serious of serious charges, two counts of first degree murder, two counts of kidnapping, one count of conspiracy to commit murder, um, Oklahoma has a death penalty. Uh, these are the most serious charges. Do you think they, they said that they don't know if they're going to pursue the death penalty? What does your gut tell you about that, Tim Jansen? Well, the facts show that it was a premeditated, told her 16-year-old daughter that they were going to go on a mission. So they were planning this. Um, they did it. They killed two people. One was completely innocent um, that they claimed, well, she was supporting the daughter. They killed him, executed him in a, in a horrible way, covered it up. So, yeah, I think they meet the all the stringent requirements for the death penalty. Um, certainly in Florida they would. And I don't know what Oklahoma, maybe the investigator can give us that information. Mm. Uh, this, of course, is Veronica Butler on the left, Jillian Kelly on the right, uh, 27 on the left, 39 on the right. They leave behind six children. Um, Dr. Michaela, uh, this is um, the worst that, that crimes uh, get. Uh, this was an execution style by all accounts, murder of these two women, women over what they believe is a custody battle between uh, the grandmother and uh, the woman on the left, Veronica Butler, uh, who had two young children. Um, KSN covered this, the local Oklahoma station. There's a reporter named Julia Thatcher, she described it as unbelievably emotional in there. Uh, in the courtroom, family members of these two that you see, of the victims, screamed out, um, "You!" it rhymes with what I'm about to say, you ducking witch and you sorry pieces of feces, but they use the other word. Uh, Michaela, are you surprised in any way that there was uh, this kind of, this level of emotion, this kind of anger uh, in the courtroom today? No, I'm not. I mean, when you do something like that, and once again, I mean, they haven't been convicted, but when somebody's uh, accused of uh, doing something like that, and especially if they have done uh, uh, something like that, the emotions run very high, highly. I mean, death is, is very serious, even more so than a rape or something like that, which is also bad be, because it's so final and you can't bring people back. I mean, no amount of sorry or doing anything can quite make up for that. I mean, and the victims will be there for the rest of their lives without their loved ones. And I I would be upset too. <laughs> I'm not a death penalty advocate, but I would be emotionally very upset with whoever did that. Uh, this is the aunt of one of the victims. Let's take a listen here. They deserve to rot and burn in the depths of hell for all I care. Uh, I don't know if that was the whole thing we see here. Rot and burn in the depths of hell for all I care. That's the whole bite. Uh, Steve Peterson, she's saying they deserve to rot in the depths of hell, burn and rot in the depths of hell uh, for all I care. I'll play it one more time. It's super short. Rot and burn in the depths of hell for all I care. Um, Steve, uh, the family had to be restrained. This woman's brother um, had to be restrained from trying to jump over and get at the defendants. Um, I can't blame them. Can you? No, of course not. Can you imagine one of your relatives, one of your loved ones being being kidnapped, disappearing the way it happened, and then finding out that they are brutally murdered over a custody issue complaint? Something so trivial when you think about it by this idiot grandmother? I mean, uh, I could certainly understand the the emotion and the 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 anger and frustration yeah, i i think it's very understandable 100 and and to go on the same woman said 
Uh, Tim Jans Jansen, this is a direct quote. Uh, the same woman said, to hold my brother back from jumping, there's just too many emotions, so much anger. I don't understand how somebody can hate somebody so much that you want to kill them. My niece, uh, I believe it is Veronica Butler in this case, did not deserve that, and neither did the young lady with her, uh, Jillian Kelly. Uh, Tim, have you been in a courtroom when the emotions just get so charged that you can you can cut it with a knife? Tension. I, I actually have, and it's when I prosecuted a young man came from a very affluent family. I was a federal prosecutor at the time, and the sister kicked her shoe towards the federal judge, and her shoe went flying. Uh, the oh. young man was going to prison. He was growing marijuana in a national forest, but unfortunately for him, he was carrying a pistol on his hip. So he got a five-year consent. So he got like 55 months in, in prison. Um, but you see it all the time. You, you see murder cases and murder cases especially are because, you know, you got a whole side of the courtroom. You got another side where the victims are. And it leads to problems where you have to have ample security because, you know, it gets out of hand. It's very emotional. Child custody issues, I would say, are magnified. Because, you know, child custody issues are so dangerous for lawyers, for the judges. Um, both of these people were completely innocent. They did not deserve to die. They did not deserve to be harmed. And so them plotting and planning this and telling their 16-year-old daughter what they're doing and then coming back nonchalant saying, well, we're not going to see them anymore. Well, why did you kill Butler? Well, she was supporting her. No care in the world. They're just awful oh. people. Yeah, Butler, uh, Kelly was supporting Butler, but that's part of the affidavit, and we will uh, go through uh, bits and pieces of it. Um, look at this, Laura G., uh, victim of a horrible crime. I had to hold it together when the trash that killed my sister-in-law and nephew walked into court. I know the feelings. I can only imagine if anything like this happened uh, to my family, I would be doing and feeling uh, the same things, I'm sure. Um, pure evil, that's a good way to put it. Um, I had someone, I said this in the earlier show, that came at me for uh, portraying rural Oklahoma as uh, um, anything but, um, I don't know, nice and quaint. But um, this is not a picture of, obviously, Oklahoma. This is a certain group of people, and I've been to all kinds of bad places uh, as a um reporter in my career and is not a reporter. I've been to some places that are hairy. Um, but um, look, these people, all you have to do is really just take a look at them. Um, and uh, you can, it, it says a lot, let's put it that way. Um, there's just evil in some of these people's eyes and uh, they're going to get what's coming to them, but the uh, judicial process will have to play out. Um, the, the question that just came up, uh, Dr. M, is how in the world did this woman in the top left, who has a rap sheet, we've asked this before, just wondering if you've gotten any more clarity on how Grandma Tiffany Adams was able to have custody of uh, Veronica's children in the first place. Well, and once again, I, I, in a place that's as small as that area where it was up in Texas County, I mean, even in places that are bigger, like in Oklahoma County, Tulsa County, uh, Cleveland County, stuff like that. I mean, the oversight isn't always what you would think it would be. And it's just not. I mean, people can easily just duck and dodge out of child custody. The courts, they can pick up, they can leave, they can try to make it where they can't be found. I mean, and with a limited number of options sometimes for family and for foster care and, and adoption, I mean, there's not always a lot of choice as to whom you're going to leave it with. And I don't know if in this case, if it was just oversight or neglect or they didn't have options or what, but, but it doesn't surprise me whatsoever that those with such criminal backgrounds as all of them had were, were in charge of the case. <laughs> Someone's dog chiming in, and I love yeah, it. Yeah, that's um, mine. I mean, I'm sorry about that. No, it's all good, Steve. What kind of dog, Steve Peterson? I didn't even know you had a dog till right now. I have two dogs. Both are rescue, and the one barking is my uh, uh, Australian border collie, who is 17 years old and deaf. But wow. she, she sees something out in the street, and she'll just bark. So, wow. And uh, 
she can't hear herself, so it doesn't bother her. But uh, God no, bless. And she can't Steve. hear me telling her to shut up, so it doesn't matter. It was a waste of time as well. Seven, we always try to find humor, even in the worst stories. Um, but uh, we are dog lovers and cat lovers here. Uh, not Singer. SD. Yeah, not John Singer. Forget John, John Singer. Singer. <laughs> <laughs> He's canceled. Uh, <laughs> driving to Carms, Perp Walk and Studio. Um, what a life everyone lives while I work. Everyone's... My family's in town for the Passover holiday. And speaking of that, uh, they're not going to be live shows Monday and Tuesday. So get your addiction now. We will have other. Uh, we did a show, really interesting show with a hostage negotiator that we're going to air on Monday. And uh, we're going to bring you an older show on Tuesday. So uh, just a heads up, no shows Monday and Tuesday. Um, if you're able to uh, support the show on Patreon, uh, we will do live premieres. If you're able to support, and we've got uh, the Karen Reed trial that will be in full swing next week on this channel. But uh, if you are able to support on Patreon, please um, do that as we uh, are winding our way through this podcasting uh, wild west here. Um, tremendous amount of work, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, a lot of work does go into this show. So um, there you go. And I've got the perp walk in a minute. Um, so to you, uh, Steve Peterson, just sort of the same question here. I mean, did someone really drop the ball? The fact that this woman who has a rap sheet and who has, and by the way, that was, I meant to bring this question up. Um, John uh, Wesley John Holmes, who comes to us from Australia, living in Tokyo. Um, is it true they tried to have her murder previous to this? In the affidavit, it does say that there were threats uh, made against Veronica, Veronica Butler. Um, so Steve Peterson, previous threats and this woman has a rap sheet and she's got custody of Veronica Butler's child. How did someone drop the ball? Will they have to investigate this? Well, you, you figure as Dr. Uh, Dr. M just said, you know, you're in a very rural part of the state with not a lot of resources, not a lot of uh, access to, to different resources that, that you would need. You figure initially the son who's in rehab the son got custody of the children because it turns out the mother's brother or relative is accused of sexually molesting the children. So they take it away from mom. They give it to the son. Uh, they give it to dad and dad's in rehab. He can't do it. So grandma steps up to the plate and says, I'll take the kids and I'll take care of them. But mom only gets supervised visitation because she's got a child molester in the family. You know, and the courts are trying to weed through all this. None of this ever happens um, quickly. You know, the wheels of justice turn very, very slowly. And in some rural areas, because of resources, they, they grind even slower. So it is a shame. And, and, you know, things do fall through the cracks. And I'm not saying that's the case here. But it, it didn't seem like you had a lot of good choices. Then perhaps just to remove the children completely, put them in foster care, if there were foster people available. There may not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Steve Peterson in the uh, Celtic Green, even though he is um, really a diehard Bruins fan, but he he, uh, he loves both teams. <laughs> he is from Boston and lives in South Carolina. And speaking of that, Steve Peterson, you better read up on Karen Reed because we're airing that trial on this channel. It's from your home uh, state and city, and that trial is incredibly divisive. Um yeah, Tim my Jansen. brother. My brother asked me about that today, so I have yeah. to do some research onto that. Yeah. There's a lot of questions to be asked in that case. I'll put it that way. But um, Gerald Peter here, Tim Jansen. This case is a slam dunk for the state as long as they have a legal confession. What if they don't have a legal confession? It seems to be a very strong case. Mm -hmm. You don't need a legal confession. Um, you can try cases even if you don't have eyewitnesses. You have a strong circumstantial evidence case. You have a confession to the daughter, the 16-year-old, she's probably going to have to be put in protective custody. Um, and, and I think the physical evidence and the phones, again, the digital data traces these people where they were. Um, did we ever find out where they were, whose property they were found on? It's a great question. Uh, Dr. Ram, do we know? I know it was eight miles away. I don't think we do, right, Michaela? No, they were about eight and a half miles away, and they were like buried in some uh, concrete is all that we have at this point. Yeah. But but their bodies were confirmed that those were the two bodies of the deceased uh, women out there. 
Yeah, they so were they positive. tracked them by the phones, right? The geo tracking on the phones pinging. Right, and you can the cell cell towers, the the geolocation, all that. Yeah, I mean that you can tell where they were and when they went there, and yeah. who was there, and everything like that. It's going to be hard for them to get out out of that, unless they maybe maybe left all their phones somewhere else. But that would be kind of suspicious too. <laughs> yeah. so, that's such a great tool for law enforcement now, the geo tracking because the phones ping off towers, and you get multiple people get them a location and how long they're there. It really is very hard for defendants to get around that. Yeah. Uh, I Annie, well, they try. Annie, they use burner phones, you know, yeah. and and yeah. through the use of burner phones, they try to avoid being able to be identified by their own personal cell phones. So they attempted to avoid and evade that type of detection, but they were unsuccessful. Yeah, we'll right. get into that because Tiffany Adams' phone, uh, her her personal, not the burner phone, had some crazy searches on there, the affidavit reveals, which we'll get into. But Annie Kay here, um, Dr. Michaela, do you think these four felt they had some sort of strange legal immunity that protects their actions? They're said to be sovereign citizens, which I don't get because you see here, um, Brady Starr, the granny was that, I love that everyone's calling her the granny here. I love that. The granny was the head of the local Republican party, which is true uh, in her county. They were all very well connected. Um, can you be a sovereign citizen and be head of a Republican Party, Michaela? Why not? I mean, I mean in today's, in today, I mean, this age, sure. I mean, of course, I mean, you can be anything you want, but um, a lot of the sovereign citizens and those similar types of movements feel they're untouchable. The granny looks surprised in a mugshot. Uh, the uh, I think it was like the Connor guy, like the older guy that was like 50, uh, the one on the uh, bottom left was uh, uh, smirking. And yeah. uh, that's I mean, Cole, Cole Twombly. Cole. And that's his wife on the right. Yeah. 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 It, I mean, these he, weren't the mugs, but yeah. Yeah. He was uh, uh, smirking about it in the uh, photo. I mean, so yeah, I mean, they, they, they probably thought that they weren't going to get caught or they just didn't care. Or and the granny looked like she was surprised that they got caught. You know that they have people come and arrest them. You know so. Steve Peterson, uh, the guy in the top right looks like he could be your great grandfather. He's forty three years <laughs> old, um, which freaks me out. I can't go to, can't get over that. But uh, Steve, the yeah. medical examiner has not released the report. Um, when should we expect that? Well, again, it, here we get back right back to resources again. How long will it take them to have the autopsy done? And, and what resources do they have? What's the backlog? You know, all these questions need to be answered. But I can imagine, you know, the last time we met on the show to discuss the same case, we kept saying, you know, what's the what's the holdup? What's going on? How come the families aren't protesting more? How come they're not, you know, showing up and demanding answers? I think all along, Oklahoma SBI has had kind of a handle on this thing, and they've been digging and digging. And just as we discussed last time, once people get in custody and the public feels that they are no longer a threat, you will find more people that will come out and say, hey, this is also what I heard, and hey, this is also what I saw, and this is also what was done. You'll have witnesses come forward now because they don't feel like their lives are threatened. You look at those four clowns in the jumpsuits there. And you know that they are some dangerous people. You can tell by the attitudes on their face during their mugshots that, you know, they, they think this is a joke, that they, they, they're not really concerned. They, they're probably surprised, like Dr. Ron said, that they've been arrested, they've been caught. They all think they're much smarter than the system. But um, now that they're incarcerated, now that they're going to be held, and Oklahoma has executed uh, uh, just fewer than Texas. And Texas holds a record in the United States of death penalty executions. Oklahoma is second. So I would expect I would expect all four of these people to face the death penalty uh, as this case progresses. Uh, if anyone deserves it, it's these guys. Um, you know, if you believe in the death penalty, then uh, this is uh, about as good a, a, a time uh, to invoke it once and if they are uh, convicted in a court of law. Um, back to Dr. Michaela on this. Does anyone know the extent of their sovereign citizenship in cult situ situation? 
Do you have a handle of why people were so scared? I mean, I know you live yourself in a remote area, um, Dr. Saramosing, Sarah but um, any sense of why there was so much fear around these people, according to reports? Sovereign citizens have absolutely zero respect for the law. So <laughs> they're not afraid to shoot law enforcement. I mean, if you see, I mean, even, I mean, you can just Google, uh, uh, like on YouTube or other places, uh, sovereign citizen uh, shoots police officer at traffic stop. And you'll see a lot of videos like that because I mean, they don't care and they don't feel like that they should have to care. <laughs> and, and they don't. And it was more than just these four or five people in the group. I mean, you had more people in the towns and the areas that would meet at a church. I mean, that would meet, I mean, at their house. I mean, they would have meetings, like, I mean, regular meetings about the God's Misfits group and, and discuss, I mean, very these conspiracy theories and sovereign citizen type things. So, no, it doesn't sur sur surprise me at all because they just don't care. Mm. Uh, Janet Ray, um, Granny's boyfriend was best friends with a judge who probably vouched for them. So this just goes to Steve Peterson's uh, point about a very um, rural area, a small town, um, and a lot of people connected. There was, I, I don't know if this is the same judge, but um, the COE and I are friends with Brian Enton, the uh, crime reporter over at News Nation. He interviewed a judge last night and that judge today had to resign. I'm wondering if it's the same one. <laughs> it is the same one. Yeah, is it? Is. Yeah, yeah it okay. is the same, same judge. So he had a he had to resign because of all these uh conflicts. Just goes to show you again, small town nature here. Um MJ, great comment. I want Freddie Morris Roosevelt Brown to meet uh Miss Peaches. That's Dave Portnoy's rescue. I'll say this in all due respect to both the dog and Dave Portnoy. Uh, Fred Brown is a trillion times cuter than Peaches, but um, MJ, try to make it happen. We don't live far from each other. Um, his house is just a little bigger than mine, but I have no disdain at all. Um, he sold his company for about a hundred million dollars. So uh, good, to, good on David Portnoy, but uh, my dog's cuter. So, so there you go, Dave. Um, Tim Jansen. Um, of course, the arrest affidavits were released and we're finding out a lot of information, not the least of which is Tiffany Adams, um, the woman top left in this photo here. Um, she, she top left actually looks good there compared to her mugshot. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out they were in a very long custody battle uh, with Veronica Butler, um, the, the, the woman who was murdered. And as we were just talking about, there were death threats, but this custody battle went back to 2019. Um, you and I have covered uh, the Adelson and Markells. Um, what is it? I mean, what is it about family court, Tim Jansen? Um, and is there anything that could have been done, you think, to prevent this? You know, you, you, you said it, they're in a rural area. You know, when, uh, when there's an issue with the, the parents, they try to go to rel familiar relatives, right? And if there's no familiar relatives, then they try to, then they go to, you know, foster home. There's no foster home. Where are they going to take them? Now, she might have had a criminal history, but if she didn't have any history of abusing children or violence against children, and it was drugs or something else, um, they probably, she was willing to take them and they decided to do it. Um, we don't know if these threats were ever told to law enforcement. Or if it was something that just speculated or came out later after this murder, um, child custody is it's just it's it's personal, very personal. Um, people get desperate because they feel like they're losing the, their child forever. Uh, they hate the spouse for one reason or the in laws, and then when they think they're going to lose their their child, it magnifies it, and they get angry and they lash out instead of using the court system. Yep. Yep. Uh, very well said. Uh, Steve Peterson, they always say that uh, family court's more dangerous than criminal. Here from Theos, um, what was the actual motivation is the question for the killings. It cannot be out of care for the children, and they can't really have thought they'd get away with murdering two people. Um, by all accounts, by all indications, it was because of this custody battle. Steve, why the hell? I'm going to play the perp walk from today, but Steve, why do people... Think this is hang on a second. This is Cole Twombly. 
see him in uh, the vest and jacket. Do you have any remorse? Actually, I just want to like it. Did you do it? Did you murder those women? Do you have anything to say to the children whose mothers are murdered? Why? I love when reporting out out questions like that. It's just perfect. Forty-three. I need to work on my gear a little. Anything to say? Did he just say he needed to work on his beard? I think so. I stepped out. Here. <laughs> oh, here's, oh, here's Granny. Incoming at all. Granny doesn't look happy. Oh, so that was all of them except for uh, the wife of Cole Twombly. Um, the question was, Steve Peterson, it couldn't be over a custody battle, but it looks like it was. And I mean, I ask you this every time you're on what I mean, you just saw this. This woman, uh, Tiffany Adams, has a look of disdain. What is it where she thought she was going to get away with this? I mean, it's crazy. It's it's maniacal. We're, we're, we're trying to make sense out of nonsense. Yeah. You know, it's impossible for rational people to rationalize such horrific acts. So we mean we can ask this question all day long because we're rational people. But you know, when you talk to crazy, you never know what kind of answer you're gonna get. Obviously, they thought they could get away with it. Obviously, they thought by getting rid of mom and whoever she might have with her, that would guarantee them custody of the children. You know, they don't they don't see down the road, they don't see how their actions will eventually uh, get them caught. They they don't look at the world that way. They're above the world. They're above the law. So, you know. Uh, the best thing to ever happen to um, this guy, uh, Wrangler, who's the father of Veronica Butler's children, that is, name, is his name, Wrangler Rickman, uh, is that he was um, in a court-appointed rehab. He was brought in there. Um, probably the best thing to ever happen to him because maybe he'll skirt charges. We don't know the full extent of the story yet. But Grace and Harmony are asking, is the 16-year-old daughter, the Twombly's daughter, who is the hero of the story, she appears to be. She gave a lot of very important information. She's, I don't think, identified by name. She's just identified as a juvenile 16-year-old. Um, so, But that is who everyone is assuming um, is the person that helped law enforcement. Now, um, Tim Jansen um, the judge ordered the four held without bond. The DA, again, says he's uh, undecided about seeking the death penalty. Um, why is it that some cases get bond, others don't? In this case, I'd assume you'd think that they, they wouldn't and are not going to. So these people are going to be sitting in jail till a trial happens, I take it. Well, usually first degree murder cases, you don't get bail. Um, the, the way this crime occurred is another they're dangerous. They're dangerous to the community. Um, clearly, they've executed two innocent people. No judge who's ever going to be elected or appointed again would give them bond. Um, and they, they don't need to be on the streets. And you, and you look what they did here. Just think about what they did here. Can you imagine all the other crimes and bullying they did in these counties? Can you imagine what they did, that they rose to the level that they could kill two people think they could bury him in cement and then keep custody of the kid and nobody would know. Isn't that what they're thinking, right? We're going to bury him in cement. They never find the bodies. We're going to leave the car there with blood towards the direction of their their location. And they thought they were going to get away with it. Yeah, <laughs> and at, at, one, at one point, people thought, I mean, even worse, that they fed him to hogs. Um, but it was this uh, wanting to bury them in this, like a cement well or something. Uh, Jessica Souza here. This was interesting to me. Um, Tim Jansen, I'll come back to you on this one. All three of these POSs uh, have their own attorney, and Cora Twombly said she needs a public defender. They must be so mad at her for telling her 16 year old daughter what they did, and I wonder if she will spill her guts. So, Cora and Cole, Tim, are married, but one is, says he's going to hire, uh, Cole says he's hiring a defense attorney. The wife is, is what's going on here, Tim? 
Well, I'd like to know who they're going to hire. Are they going to get the same lawyer for the husband and the wife? Are they hiring lawyers who are also members of sovereign citizens? Or are they going to hire lawyers who are outside of there? And what kind of fees do lawyers there get for murder cases? Um, those, but, those are but questions. Tim, why, like but Tim, why, why, would she, why would he pay for a defense attorney, but he's not paying for his wife's defense? She's going to have a public defender. Is this because they're at odds now? No, maybe his family is going to pay for him, but they're not going to pay for the spouse. Hmm. Um, Dr. M, do you have any uh, any any scoops on this uh, as to why they're going to have the only person with a public defender is going to be Cora Twombly? Yeah, I mean, usually when you, when you get bond, it's like you have to pay for, for your attorney. But as of right now, I mean, there's no bond given, which I which does not surprise me in the least the, because of the severity of the allegations and the perceived threat to society, as you had uh, stated earlier. Um, but I mean, some sometimes having more lawyers can help um, lessen the workload as opposed to if it's one lawyer for all four people, or you could have separate trials for each per person, try, try them individually. Maybe there's more evidence against one than the other. I mean, those are all factors, but you typically, typically get a better chance at a more favorable outcome for the defendant when, of course, you hire uh, your own private attorney if you get a good one, uh, because the the public defenders oftentimes just don't have the time or the resources with which to conduct an effective criminal defense, and they don't really have as much access to private investigators and other stuff uh, like those who have the funds to do so can can achieve. I'm bringing in this up again, and I'll do it one more time because this is uh, important to me personally. Tomorrow night. 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Ellen Greenberg. She's a young 27-year-old uh, teacher. She was engaged to a guy named Sam Goldberg. She is stabbed 20 times on a very snowy night, uh, 10 to the front of her body, 10 to the back of her neck and the back of her head. And an independent autopsy showed that two of the stab wounds happened after she was already dead, but they've ruled it a suicide. And this case has never, ever been investigated and uh, reeks of corruption. And Sam Goldberg's uncle was a high level judge. And they went and cleaned the crime scene, took computers, took cell phones. And tomorrow night, we've got uh, the Greenbergs themselves on and uh, the attorney, uh, Joe Pedraza, as well as Gavin Fish. He's been all over this case. He's an investigative reporter. Please, 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 please show support for the Greenberg family tomorrow night. This case has got to be investigated. A killer has been walking on the streets all these years. So please join us at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Harley Ryder. Uh, there's some locals in here from Oklahoma. Tom Bryce's property, a friend. I'm not sure, but he's the one that told law enforcement he thought they were on his land. Um, so um, the pieces of this puzzle still being put together. Steve Peterson, of the four here, um, the person to me that seems like the weakest link um, is Cora on the bottom right, Cora Twombly. Do you think that uh, prosecutors and law enforcement are gonna lean on her right now, uh, possibly to get some sort of cooperation and a plea deal um, to get the other, threes, the other threes squared away? Well, it, it really would depend on her culpability and her, her actions, but I would say mm -hmm. that would be my, that would be my guess. You know, one of the listeners who typed in the chat made a good point. How does a sovereign citizen get a public defender? So I'm not sure how all that works, technically speaking. But uh, if she, in fact, does have a public defender and not and not hiring their own attorney, I if I was the prosecution and I'm sure that uh, that Tim would agree, you know, you would you'd go after her to say, listen, we'll cut you a deal because your daughter's the one that snitched all of you out. Mm -hmm. And now the daughter is going to be in the same role as as Veronica's kids. Who, who are you going to put the daughter with? Sixteen years old. She's too she's too young to be on her own. You know, you got this whole mafioso type atmosphere going on there in Oklahoma. You're going to put this sixteen year old kid with another family member. You're going to have some more killings involved. Yeah. So, I would be tempting. I'd be tempting Cora. To say you come forward now, you can avoid the needle, right? You can avoid the death penalty, 
Mm. Uh, plead down to something that you'll get out of jail in 10 or 15 years and still be able to see your own child as long as you come yeah. forward and testify. Uh, Tim, what do you think? That'd be my that'd be my angle. Yeah, and well, Tim, look at this look at this comment, Tim, from Pat Hansen. Granny's gonna flip first. I don't know how they're coming up with that. By the way, um, we're getting some interesting information. Um Paul Grice is the land where the there, there's this guy Grice is there's a lot of talk about this guy because he's named in the affidavit, but it almost sounds like he's like a co-conspirator, the way he's discussed in the affidavit. So it's going to be, this is what I'm talking about here from Harley Ryder with uh, Paul Grice. And then I did not know this, um, and I don't know if this is true, but Ms. Cattle Rancher, uh, about four years ago, Cole Twombly's son was found dead on his ranch in his pickup and his dog had been shot too. You know, what, have you heard this, Michaela? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff that's not right there. One thing that I do want to say, though, about the uh, sovereign citizens, if I may, because our firm has actually represented sovereign citizens before, and we have. We've helped them. They've been in prison. They've been in jail. One of the things that I wanted to mention that the other two were talking on is that on um, the sovereign citizens, though, is that um, most of the sovereign citizens that we ever represented uh, wanted to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. And so now the court, I think if that happens, which is stupid on their part, because A, they don't have any legal training. B, I mean, co contrary to what they think, that they don't don't know the law. And B, a lawyer that represents uh, themselves has a fool for an attorney, like the old saying. But typically what the courts will do is that they will appoint a standby public defender who will be there to answer questions on their behalf if they have them. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they try to represent themselves in it. Um, man, what a crazy case. The next court appearance is going to be uh, May 15th. So it's about two, three weeks away. But Tim Jansen, back to you on um, yeah, on this notion. Someone said granny might be first to flip. Um, what's going on behind the scenes right now? I mean, what Steve said would scare the crap out of me. You know, we're going to put a needle in you um, unless you unless you talk to us. Um, Michelle Dematis says, all I see is I'm going to get the hate mail for this, but I like your comment. All I hear is banjos when I see their mug shots, but, uh, Tim Jansen, what about someone flipping on somebody else? Who's most likely, and will that be, uh, pursued by prosecutors and law enforcement? Well, Steve knows as being a DEA agent, you get a big bust and you sit down and you talk about who's who, what role did everybody play and who's the main person? Who's the main that led this whole thing. That's the one that's going to get the last deal, right? Um, you want to give the least culpable, but one that has enough in information that can prosecute all of them. So they're going to rely on the agents and the investigators to tell the prosecutor. Then you sit down in a room, right? Like you always do. What do you think about this? There are lawyers who start calling you and then you make a decision. You say, okay, we want to do an interview. I'll bring Steve in. We want to hear what the person's going to say. We'll, we'll do a proffer. And you tell me what, and then you check it out. Is that proffer true or not? If he's bullshitting this, we'll go to the next one. Um, and it also depends on the lawyer, right? You need an experienced lawyer. You can get really inexperienced lawyers in there and the proffer goes down and that witness can never be used again because they've already given a bad interview and you got to do your DEA six. They're no longer usable, right? So you want an experienced lawyer that can go outside, take a break, say, listen, idiot. This is your last deal. Tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth right now, or you're not getting a deal. Go back in, or the music sounds great. You're going to get the deal. And I, I can tell you I've done this so many times, uh, and I know Steve has. Um, I think that the grandmother might be the leader of this thing. Um, I think the muscle might have been her husband, and I think he got the other guy to help carry the bodies, move the bodies, and I think the other girl probably was just a driver maybe drove. Uh, and I think grandma didn't even go because grandma's not that dumb. Um, but they had some sophistication. They did try to get burner phones. Um, but you know, sovereign citizens, I, they always want to represent themselves. They didn't want to listen to my advice. I tell them what the law is. They tell me, I don't know the law. I'm like, okay. Um, but they want to represent themselves. They have a little information, but they take it so out of whack. And the courts will always appoint 
standby counsel, and that lawyer hates that position. They don't want to be in that position to have to jump in because that defendant doesn't trust that lawyer either. So uh, I saw some questions about how can they get court-appointed lawyers if they're sovereign citizens. You don't have to have money. In fact, if you don't have money, that's when you get the court-appointed lawyer. You don't have to say, I believe in the laws. All you have to do is be charged with a crime, punishable by a felony, and you don't have the funds for a lawyer. Gideon versus Rainwhite. That's why, you know, they're going to get court-appointed lawyers. And if they conflict out, they probably have lawyers who are on a list who, ag who agree to take indigent clients if there's a conflict. Uh, I'm just, curious to see who the private lawyers are going to represent these people. Yeah. That's what I want to see. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Um, and I'm curious to see if they come from, you know, uh, Oklahoma City or bigger, you know, more populated areas. Um, we just did a whole show on Brian Koberger at five o'clock today about the amazing, amazingly high costs um, to, for the, you know, to try him um, for his public defender. And guys, they're spending way more money on him than any wealthy person would ever be able to spend on themselves or, you know, most wealthy people. Um, so he he's getting, um, you know, at, at having a public defender, he is getting amazing representation or so it seems at least by the amount of money they are spending. Uh, Georgia OKC here says, Joel, the properties the bodies were found on were being rented by the boyfriend. So um, he was renting that. And I guess it's from this guy, Grice, who's kind of, whose okay. name has been dragged into this. Um, are there other misfits to watch out for, uh, Michaela? That's the question. But my question to you, um, you know, where, where a lot of us are just hearing about God's misfits, these people are alleged to be part of this group. Do you have any more information on who these people are, what this group is all about? You know, if they had weekly meetings, monthly meetings, what what the whole deal is with them? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there are more uh, God's misfits out there. It's not just those uh, four or five. But there were certainly others in different locations as well. It wasn't just in that one town. Um, they did have uh, meetings at a local church. I'm not sure of the name. And also at the house, I think of the grandma. Um, and her boyfriend, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they're basically sovereign citizen, conspiracy theories, right wing, I mean, beyond MAGA, like type, you know, just like way, way, way to the right, like all the way over there that, that you can possibly get. And then some, I mean, that's how far out there that the sovereign citizens are because they just don't care about any other laws except what they want to care about. And they don't see anybody can enforce them. Nobody can stop them. I can do whatever I want. There are no laws. I'm not restricted by anything. And I've I've known people personally like that. You know, so we we worked for them. We tried to help them in legal situations. We've, I mean, I've met a friend one time that I didn't know was a sovereign citizen type of mindset. I was like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> and and to hear her talk about, yeah, I just was was out there, very out there. Hmm. Uh, Steve Peterson, I ask you this question every time, too, as though you know everything going on. But from an investigative standpoint, um, you know, it seems like the case is, quote unquote, solved. They found the bodies. They arrest the people. But this investigation is really just getting going. What are they going to have to do now, uh, law enforcement? Well, the first thing they need to do is do autopsy of the of the two women and figure out how they how exactly they were killed. And, you know, one of your listeners had put in the chat a very good point. I don't know anything about this Bryce guy, the owner of the land, who um, uh, Tad Cullum apparently rented the land from and did some work on. He's mentioned, as you have said, all through the affidavit. So he may also be one of these, like the daughter of the Coles, who has already kind of flipped and, you know, figured, hey, listen, better to be a witness than a defendant. And, you know, it's easy to drag my name through the mud, put this out there. So I better get on, you know, whoever gets on the bus first gets the, first, the best seat. So I better get up and on there quick and avoid being indicted, avoid being arrested and start cooperating immediately. But once they do an autopsy and figure out exactly how the women were killed, as morbid as that sounds, then we can try to put some type of, of uh, um, responsibility as to who, was, who actually did the killing. You know, I find it difficult to believe that that uh, Cole's wife there um, was involved 
physically with the killing, but nothing surprises me anymore. I'm I'm guessing that old Mr. Bald Headed ZZ Top guy, him and uh, and the other guy, the chuckles there. I, I I have a feeling that two of them did the actual killing. Grandma stayed well out of range because she knew she was going to be one of the first suspects. So she wanted to make sure she had an alibi. You know, look at my phone. I never left the house. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything. Blah blah blah. blah. So I really believe that you know she'll be the last to go. Uh, but I think they're going to try to put the murders of the two women onto the two guys here. And if they can flip the mother, you know, the one lower uh, right, they've got Bryce already in on their side already, and they've got the daughter. I think they're well on their way. To, now it's just a matter of kind of sweeping up the pieces and trying to put together the uh, the timelines based on the phone information, putting it all logistically uh, in line chronologically where you can explain the story to a jury. That's so the goal. Steve, Get so 12 Joel, people to be guilty. Yeah, yeah, Just for corner, him. sovereign citizens do not cut plea deals. They don't do that because they don't believe in the government. They don't believe in cooperating with them on a plea deal. So Hold on. What if they're about to get a needle put in their arm? No, no, you don't understand these people. They don't believe that the United States has any authority over them. They don't recognize and they will shoot police officers on site. Mm -hmm. uh, they're certainly not going to enter into a contract with the government. Um, that's just how that's they a good are. point. That's, She's that's very a, right. That, that's yeah, a great we had a sovereign uh, a citizen just a little while ago, just last year, get convicted and sent to jail, sent to prison for many, many years. And I tried to convince his mother. I said, look, at least have him have the defense attorney represent him. Uh, the public defender and he just wouldn't do it and he nope. of course i said you're gonna lose your son for a long time and he's gonna go to prison for a long time i mean have him take a deal have him do something i mean just like he said you know wouldn't happen not not gonna happen both of those gentlemen all right um i would like to get we've had a guest on he's the preeminent expert uh, in the world on cults rick allen ross let me know if you guys want me to get him on to discuss God's misfits. I think we should get him on. It would be fascinating. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he knows, but he's tapped in more than anybody else about cults and groups like this. So I'm sure he is familiar with them. Let me know if you want me to get him on. Uh, we could do that next week as we continue to follow this case. Uh, meanwhile, Tim Jansen, <coughs> excuse me, attorneys on both sides now are speaking out. A guy named Stephen Jones, PH, Stephen with a PH. He's Tiffany Adams' attorney, was uh, his uh, custody attorney, a family attorney. Um, he was asked by uh, COCA, which is the local Oklahoma City News, by a reporter named Megan Mosley. And the question was, do you think her grandchildren were motive enough to kill Veronica? His response was, I don't think I should speak to that. Uh, sounds <laughs> like an attorney, Tim Jansen. Uh, he says, and I quote here, we had a cooperative relationship, so I don't know what was going on, obviously, to the full extent that others did. Tim Jansen, um, when do you talk to the media? Because this guy obviously was uh, in no mood to answer questions, didn't want to give out any information. Well, you know, there's some cases you just don't say anything, right? And you really can't. Or you say, we're going to we're conduct our own in independent investigation and we're, we're denying the allegations, right? Or if you have a case where you clearly have a defense, then you might throw out the defense. Um, but not, you shouldn't every time have a press conference um, because you, you're going to end up, you don't know all the evidence. You come out there and make a defense, and then the evidence is completely inconsistent with what you just said. You've lost credibility. Your client's lost credibility. And you're probably going to get fired, and you're going to look like a fool. And the worst thing that a defendant needs is a fool for a client, right? So you have to weigh it and measure it. Uh, less is usually more. Um, now, if you win the trial and you go on the courtroom steps, then you can talk, have a press conference. Uh, fast as 90 minutes and all of uh, showbiz right here on uh, Surviving the Survivor. We've got about another, let's make these guys hang around, hang around for another 30 minutes or so because I've got a lot of the affidavits still to go to. But now, a guy named Garrett Oates, he is the uh, attorney for Veronica Butler, and he said, 
whether this whole motivation was the custody battle or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if someone is gone forever, then that decision is permanent and you can't take that back. Um, that's a pretty good point, Steve Peterson. Steve, let me ask you this. Um, you've been around so many criminals in your life um, <laughs> and people are looking forward to the Ellen show. Please try to be here. Not Ellen DeGeneres, but Ellen Greenberg. Uh, much more important, in my opinion, than Alan DeGeneres. So be here tomorrow to support the Greenberg family. Steve Peterson, what do you think these uh, four are thinking about um, as they're sitting in a in a county jail in Texas County, Oklahoma tonight? You know, I'm, I'm leery to even imagine what these idiots are thinking <laughs> because they're not thinking anything that normal people would be thinking. They're not thinking like any of the four of us right now. They're probably wondering how they got caught. They are probably wondering, you know, or, or convincing themselves that these laws have nothing to do with them. They're above all this. They'll get out of this because they're sovereign. They don't recognize the law and they can get away with all this. And it's just going to be a matter of time before somebody stands up and tells the judges that sovereign citizens are free to do whatever it is they wish to do. Waiting for this miracle to happen, that that's never going to happen. But they don't see it that way. They don't look that far ahead. And and like I said before, you can't make sense out of nonsense. You know? Black Widow comes to us from the Republic of Ireland. Um, some people would call these four country hicks. I'm just wondering, um, these gods misfits. But uh, Black Widow, what, what is the equivalent in Ireland? I'm curious. Let us know. Um, Lori uh, Lanny, Lonnie, Lonnie Picard. Uh, Tim Jansen, a very uh, legal question here. Obviously, it goes to you. If the two women were not transferred alive, could the kidnapping charge be dropped? Great job, STS. Um, sort of a moot point because you got murder on the table. But what about this legally speaking, I guess? Well, more than likely, they were shot and moved out of the car. They probably didn't die in the car because I don't think there was enough blood to show they were killed. So moving the bodies from the car could support a kidnapping charge and take him somewhere. And if they end up dying, well, you kidnapped him and they died while you were kidnapping him. So I don't think that's a problem. Mm. By the way, you can do this. Text Governor Shapiro, uh, the COE is hanging with CARM. So I can't put that number up uh, and demand justice for Ellen Greenberg. We will have um, that all tomorrow. Again, this is a, a young woman, 27, um, Stabbed 20 times, 10 to the front of her body, 10 to the back of her head and neck. Try to do that right now. And two of them were post-mortem, according to an independent autopsy. In my opinion, a killer has been on the loose since 2011. An attorney for the family is coming on tomorrow night, as are the Greenbergs and uh, reporter Gavin Fish. So please show them your support. Uh, I'll just say this. Usually when we have these shows... Um, they get low, substantially lower numbers, and it drives me crazy because it's such an, an important story. So uh, if everyone can show up, it's it's not for me. It's for them, as we just lost Michaela. Um, but um, they she will come back, and I, I know the family will be very appreciative. Uh, it'll start to get attention because I think they're working on a major documentary about this now. But the case just does not get the attention it deserves. Um have Rick Ross discuss sovereign citizens also. Yes, we, when we get him on, uh, we will do that. Um, so moving along to the uh, affidavit here, and I hope we get Michaela back. I have to keep an eye because of COE. Oh, here she is. And you're back just like that, Michaela. Um, so um, Veronica Butler, Steve Peterson, in the affidavit says that she was on her way to this visitation. She was going to take her daughter to a birthday party, and they set this area, this remote road, Highway 95, U.S. Uh, 64 West and L Road and all these places as the uh, as the um, exchange point. But then the um, car was found abandoned um, on a very remote uh, road. And according to the affidavit, it's uh, it said that there was severe injury um, incurred, that there was blood along the road, blood along the road. And then Veronica's glasses on the ground and a broken hammer and a pistol magazine inside Jillian Kelly's purse. So let's break this down. Severe injury, blood along the road. What does that tell you from your experience? Does this mean that they were shot on site? Do you think uh, where the car was? And does it mean both of them? Were? No, I think they were, I think my personal belief is they were just beaten. 
where the car was. They may have used a hammer or an object similar to break a window to gain entry. You know, I saw a news report showing that, I guess, Oklahoma SBI had seized a very large um, horse trailer. And they, they suspect that the horse trailer was used to block the road to prevent the two women from making the meeting uh, spot. So they use this horse trailer and the, the trailer was seized. They believe that uh, perhaps Cole and, and old man ZZ Top there put the women's bodies in the back of the horse trailer and transported them out to the land where they were eventually disposed of or attempted to be disposed of. So I think that they used a large, uh, heavy object, maybe the hammer. There was some talk about the use of an anvil, something to break the windows to smash. Then they just beat the women drug them out, put them in the horse trailer. And, you know, whether they were shot or not, we don't really know. The, 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 I think it was um, the pastor's wife, Jillian Kelly's purse, that they found a, a magazine, a, a pistol magazine in the, um, yeah. in the purse, but they couldn't find the pistol. So. I mean, do you think that was, was you? Overpowered. Steve, do you think that gun was used against her? I mean, the magazine was in there. Um, is it possible the actual weapon was loaded with another magazine? It's possible. I mean, if you're going to carry a gun, you might as well carry an extra magazine. <laughs> That's always been my theory. <laughs> yeah. you know, so it's possible. It's possible they took it away from her. And then, you know, that just infuriates people even more, criminals, that you brought a gun. To something yeah. we were just going to beat you, but you brought a gun, so now we're more angry, and we'll use your gun against you. That that wouldn't surprise me at all, Steve Peterson. Joel, Joel, it, Joel it, it wouldn't surprise me if the facts come out and you find that that Kelly was was shot and that Veronica was beaten because it was personal against Veronica. It was mm -hmm. personal. They were going to beat her. Mm -hmm. And they had to just get the other Kelly, I guess, out of the way. And if she did have a gun, they probably just fired a gun and shot her. And then they just beat the other one for the personal vendetta that they had. Sickening. Um, Steve Peterson, what kind of force has to be used to, to break a hammer? The hammer was broken. Yeah, well, <laughs> it depends on the shape of the hammer. But, yeah, it, it, you know, breaking a car window is not as easy as you think. They don't just break like on TV. You know, mm -hmm. they're designed for impact. When they do shatter, they they bust into a billion little pieces. But it's not uncommon if you swing the hammer just the wrong way and snap off the handle. I don't know what part of the handle was broken, what part of the hammer was broken. Hell, it could have been broken when they got there. You know, these clowns. Mm -hmm. And they could have just used whatever corner of the hammer, the the claw where you pull the nails out to try to bust the window. Who knows? Who know who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, these are some good questions from Aunt Crazy, a uh, good name for this topic. Um, to Michaela, do these sovereign citizens have a driver's license or any other government issued identification? It's interesting. I mean, they 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 can. I think a lot of them don't because they don't believe that they should have to have one. <laughs> I mean, that they were like, well, if I want to drive, then I'll just drive. And so, but the sovereign citizens that I knew, like one that I had have as a friend who actually moved up to uh, up to Nevada and she filed some special sovereign citizen papers up there. But she, she, uh, and she ran from the police once cause she didn't think that she, I think she actually drove up over their uh, foot too. And, uh, and she, she, I think did get insurance but I think it was very reluctantly that she did so because she just didn't feel like it was necessary. Mm. So. Uh, Tina brings up another good point. If they're sovereign, why did they attempt to cover up their crime? I thought the law doesn't apply to them. Might not apply to them, but but uh, this doesn't keep the uh, the government, right, Tim, from going after you. Um, right. Tim Jansen, to you, moving along with the affidavit, this is the grandmother part of the affidavit, Tiffany Adams. Um, she, of course, is the children's grandmother. Her son is this guy, Wrangler Rickman, who's in rehab. Um, she, Tiffany Adams, Tim Jansen, refused to have her own son regain custody of the children because he is a drug addict. Um, and she was ordered then, Tim, this is so convoluted, Tiffany Adams was ordered to pay for 
a supervisor that she preferred. This is interesting. So the court said, you can have a supervisor, but you've got to pay for it. Um, then according to the affidavit, Granny says uh, the supervisor wasn't available, but they spoke to the supervisor and Granny told that supervisor to quote unquote, take a couple of weeks off, which is why this Jillian Kelly ended up being the supervisor. So Tim Jansen, this goes, I mean, I'm no lawyer, but this sounds like it goes to serious premeditation. She's telling a person who is supposed to be paid to be a supervisor, Granny's saying, go take a few weeks off. I might be up to no good. She didn't say that. Part, uh, absolutely. Uh, there's no coincidences. Um, it was planned. Uh, she might have liked the supervisor, uh, didn't want her to get caught up in what she was getting ready to plan. Uh, it's clearly that they're telling the daughter we're going on a mission, which means there was what you call a conspiracy, right? Two or more people agree to commit a crime. So you already have a conspiracy, and now you have two dead women. That's two murders. And the kidnapping is really just icing on the top, but that's not the ma major thing. But the comments they said before, the things they did before, all go to premeditation, all go to first-degree murder, and all can lead to a death penalty. Uh, Margaret here insisting the windows were not smashed, which makes it even worse because if the hammer was used on a person and the hammer broke, that would be the only other uh, reasonable explanation. Then uh, it's even more gruesome uh, than people thought. Um, here's uh, Angel who says Grice is not the property owner. Jamie Beasley is the property owner, which is why I heard. And Tad was renting the property from Jamie Beasley, but there is the mention of this guy Grice. Again, it sounds if anyone has information, more information on him, I'd be interested to hear about it in the chat. He almost sounds like a co-conspirator, the way the affidavit is is written. Um, Tim Jansen, they do mention this guy Grice as kind of being there. Why wouldn't someone like him be charged? Do we know? Well, he might be ultimately. He might be the one that they go to and say, hey, listen. You want to get caught up in a conspiracy to have murder? You want to spend the rest of your life in prison? Tell us what you know. Tell us about the lease. Tell us how you let these people on. And and they'll listen to him and see what he says. If it's positive, they might cut him a deal, you know? Um, and if he's a member of this group, it's really hard to get the group in that small rural area to go testify against one another. Um, I, he might get bond. If he got charged, he might get bond if he's charged with a conspiracy. Um, if they can prove that he was not involved in the actual killing, but he allowed them to use the property or knew what was going to happen. Um, I don't and, know. And Tim, what, now that we hear that they're hiring personal attorneys, is it is it safe to assume that they are not talking already? It sounds like they didn't hire him yet, but is it safe to assume that at this point they're already not talking to law enforcement? Also, uh, you, they're, sovereign if they're hiring private lawyers and they at arraignment or right after arraignment, they have not, they're probably not talking to law enforcement or cooperating yet. Um, uh, Mi Michaela, what about, I mean, what are the chances that a sovereign citizen is going to speak to a law enforcement officer when they're being interviewed? Is, are they just going to tell them to screw off? It's funny, they can't say I'm going to invoke my Fifth Amendment right because they don't believe in it. So, what do they say? Uh, two mean, words, two letters. <laughs> yeah. Well, they do. I mean, they do. Yeah. And that's exactly right. And on that hammer thing, I wanted to say that the hammers, that the car windows nowadays, unless the cars are really old, are so hard to break. I mean, they're so hard to break. And they make them that way. I, the fact that the car window was not broken doesn't sur sur surprise me. They probably broke the car window trying, thinking that they could smash with a hammer and it would break and that broke the hammer but because usually if you hit a person with a hammer usually it's not going to break but if you're trying to break a car window and you're trying hard and hard at it the new ones won't break but i can easily see you breaking your hammer in the process hmm. uh this dr von de is here and i heard this as well that the property owner the beasley guy was uh crying when he found out that this happened on his property, I think I'd be crying as well. And no one wants any of this uh, to be done anywhere near them. Um, Steve Peterson, just back to this notion that um, somehow this 
crazy granny gets custody of these kids. And then uh, the affidavit supports the fact that she told the supervisor that she would pay to come, who was the supervisor appointed by the court to take, quote unquote, a few weeks off. Um, again, how important is that to the case? Obviously, as an investigator, you're speaking to this supervisor that never showed and was told to take a few weeks off. But how critical is this to uh, building the case? Well, I think it's I think it's very critical. I think, like Tim suggested, there are no coincidences. Everything is planned out. Everything is thought out. Who knows? I, you know, and it, all this is supposition, so it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. You could say, well, perhaps that supervisor was also one of the members of this God's Misfits, and maybe they didn't want her to be injured or or put at risk by being in the car with Veronica when we when we attack. Or perhaps when the horse trailer cut them off on the road and stopped the car's forward motion going to the meat site, maybe ZZ Top guy jumps out and, and Veronica goes, oh, I recognize that guy. That's Granny's boyfriend. You know, there wasn't an immediate, in their minds, an immediate threat until things just went really, really ugly really quick. So perhaps that's why they didn't zoom off when they were cut off or when the car was stopped. I mean, who knows? You know, who knows? Yeah, uh, all this information, I think, will uh, trickle out um, over time. Brenda says the family member who found the car, this is true, said the driver's side window was uh, broken. So uh, there you go. Uh, Tarn, uh, it's never a good thing when you're made to take a few weeks off. Uh, so that's what we're finding out now. Uh, Tim Jansen, um, we learned during um, the reading of this affidavit that this custody battle dates back to 2019, that death threats were made by both um, Tiffany Adams and her boyfriend, Tad Collum. Um, and I think some of those direct uh, death threats were even directed at this guy, Wrangler Rickman, her son. Um, what does that do to the case, if that's in fact true, that she was not only carrying this murder out, but threatening to kill her own son over this. Well, you'd like to know the context of the threats. Were they coming out of the courtroom? Were they said to someone else, to a third party? Um, Steve knows in, in criminal investigations, um, that car, that crime, that car is going to give you a lot of clues about what happened, right? Mm -hmm. It was Jennifer's car driving, right? No, it was the Veronica. Mother. It was, yeah, Veronica. I mean, Veronica was driving, right? Yeah. So it was personal against her, but they had, I believe they had to take care of, of the supervisor. That's why I think they shot her and then they wanted to break in. They want to do it physically against her. Crime scenes tell you so much about what happened. Um, I don't know where these people got the idea that they were going to get away with it, but I think they don't care. And I, I think they had planned it. It reached a crescendo that they really thought they were going to lose the hearing two days from the date um, on that 17th when they were supposed to have the hearing today. Today. Uh, today they today. had to have this in place, and they thought they were going to well, they were going to execute it no matter what. It By didn't the way, Tim, today, today, today's hearing, I thought, was – sorry to interrupt, but today's, uh, today's hearing, I thought, was um, – supposed to be about getting full custody, but it wasn't even that. It was just about extended visitation, um, and it was going to happen today. I mean, it's crazy that all she was asking for was more visitation, and this was the result, isn't it? It is, but when you take into effect where they told a supervisor to take a couple of weeks off, that means that they were having something planned for a couple of weeks. And I'd like to know when they told this person that, how do we know that? And were they affiliated with this person? That person could be a key witness in this entire case because mm -hmm. she would have been a regular person that she didn't have to pay to go, right? She had to pay for this special person to go. So there's a lot of facts there that I'm sure law enforcement and if FBI is involved, they, they, they know how to get to the bottom of it. They do some data investigation, text messages and computers. They'll find it. And this employee's, She's going to have to spill the beans. Mm. Um, so this, yeah, go ahead, Michaela. I was going to say, I was just doing some research, and it, it looks like Paul Paul Grice 
was involved in the murder, that he was trying to help to plan it and help to plan the murder and had put an anvil through uh, their window and had uh, tried to lure them away. You know, I mean, I was just, just like what I was basically reading because I was just looking up Paul online to see if there was anything extra. And that's what it's saying. It says... Uh, it sounds like he's a wall. Like no one knows where this guy is. Apparently, oh, somebody knows. <laughs> yeah, there haven't been any charges filed against him. Well, so, law enforcement is going to find this guy. I can guarantee you that. Um, yeah, it's like they, a possible they, collaborator. Yeah, so, it's crazy. I mean, he sounds like a co-conspirator here. Um, so, uh, Steve Peterson, this is your world here. So the OSBI. Um, executed a search warrant of Tiffany of Granny's phone, Tiffany Adams' phone. What did they find? They find searches for taser pain levels. How much pain does it, um, you know, does it emit? Uh, gun shops, prepaid cell phones, how to get someone out of their house. Um, and then you've got uh, Chittawin Slim here. I love that. Chittawin Slim wants to know uh why stun guns before that look at this uh hi carm carm says hello according to the coe they're all hanging out having fun and uh we're hanging out having fun so uh people are saying hello to carm carm don't enjoy retirement too much because in two weeks your life's going to be upended when we go on our book tour and it's starting earlier than you thought so buckle up um why stun guns steve peterson well what better way of incapacitating somebody to drag them out of a car. I mean, if you've ever been hit with a stun gun, if you've ever have you been, been hit tased? with a taser, you don't have much flight left in you. you Steve, know? have you been tased as part of your job? I have. It's it's. Although I will tell you, I would rather be tased than pepper sprayed, but mm. I've been both, and I didn't <laughs> like either. So I can tell you. Um, and I, and when you think about it, I remember reading in one of the stories, you know, they people, some of the news reports were quoting parts of the affidavit, although I haven't seen the entire affidavit, that they went to a variety of stores in this area. And I can't imagine how many stores there were, but they did find, I think it was based on the information in Granny's phone where she was Googling uh, stun gun pain levels. They did find where she bought a number of stun guns, a number of these uh, these devices. So I think the guys went out there with these in hand. And as Tim mentioned, you know, their their uh, vitriol towards Veronica was personal. I think towards Jillian, it was just like, hey, I'm sorry, lady, you're at the wrong place, wrong time. So you can stun gun either and just beat the crap out of Veronica, throw them in the horse trailer, take them off to wherever. You know, you're going to be quick and sweet about disposing of Jillian because she's just she's just there. But Veronica, you may want to take your time and just really inflict a lot of pain because that's the whole Veronica is the whole cause of all this in Granny's eyes. And Granny is mm -hmm. kind of ramrodding all this stuff. So hmm. that's just uh, my Rosemary, Yeah, look at Rosemary Romero. Hello, Carm. Working hard signing Joel's books, question uh, mark. The only person I've ever known to sign someone else's book. And this person, Rosemary, telling her that she should get a raise for signing my books. And by the way, um, I got a whole shipment of books that we have to sign. The hardcover ones, if you want one, sign survivorbook.com. The COE failed to tell me that it ever arrived. And uh, then the kids moved it into the back room, which we rarely enter. And then... I said to her, hey, have you seen any hardcover books? And the COE says, no. Um, at which point I knew that they had to be there. And I looked around the house and then found, summarily found them and said to the COE, uh, these are the books I was just asking about. And she's like, oh, I had no idea they arrived. So that is uh, just a day in my life, in my home. Um, by the way, another day in the life of Joel. Uh, yesterday, while Carm and I were signing this book, a quick digression, and then we'll get back into it. COE is freaking out right now that I'm about to tell this story. I get a, there was a long running joke. When I was a reporter, all sorts of things would happen when, whenever I was on the road. Um, one time I was interviewing the Homeland Security Secretary, Jay Johnson. I'm underneath the Capitol. Uh, I had one half of one cell bar on my phone because you're deep underground. And it was my wife calling to tell me that she was uh, in an ambulance with my now oldest daughter, headed to the ER. She couldn't tell me why she was too hysterical. 
I literally told the Homeland Security Secretary this story, and he told me to go to the hospital. And I go there. My beloved daughter had fallen off the bed and cracked her nose. A couple of weeks later, SWAT team shows up. See, I was on the road. COE thought there was a massive break in. The wind blew the door open. Last night, Tim Jansen, I get a call. Uh, start getting texts from my kids. Uh, lo and behold, it appears that Z-Bugs, my middle child, left um, food of different variations in her bed over a period of, she, lived, she's on the, she lives on the top bunk. Um, she's got a bunk bed with my son. And uh, I never look up there because it's a little too high. Um, long story short, I know this is a long digression from a serious story. Bear with me. Uh, whatever food had accumulated there had been there for uh, a long time. And now there were what my wife described as larvae um, and many bugs, many, many bugs. Steve Peterson looks disgusted. Um, so by the time I got <laughs> home from signing books with Carm last night, my my house smelled so much like raid and bug spray that I literally feared for my kid's life. And it dragged them into the spare room where I found my hardcover books. And that, my friends, is a Tuesday night in the Waldman household. Steve Peterson, you ever had these issues when your kids were young and your wife was young? <laughs> I, I, listen, I could tell you stories, but that's not the purpose of tonight. So, <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. By the way, Steve Peterson, do you still... Um, I'm sure you were a pretty good shot at one point in your life. You still hit the uh, shooting range. Speaking of carrying a weapon. I do. Yeah, I do. And how was your shot, Steve Peterson? Don't be humble here. Uh, you know, I hit what I aim at. No, I don't <laughs> always hit where I want, but uh, I, I feel, I feel pretty good. Mm. All right. So moving along with this affidavit after my, um, I have another story on the heels of this one. I'll share that another time. It has to do with my old house in New Jersey and a fireplace. Someone remind me and I'll share that story on another day. Sort of similar to this. Anyway, um, so there were all these crazy searches for taser guns, uh, you know, how to incapacitate someone, blah, 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 blah. But then um, Tim Jansen, this could be the most important thing. This juvenile who we believe is uh, Cora Twombly's child. 16 year old tells the OSBI that she overheard conversations about Veronica Butler and claimed that her mother said, as well as Tiffany Adams and this boyfriend and her own father, that they were involved in the deaths. And then as re related to the burner phones, the same person heard that um, grandma Adams provided the burner phones to use so the group could communicate without using their personal phones. Uh, and this teen told investigators she saw two burner phones charging on Cora Twombly's nightstand. Uh, this could be their death knell, literally and figuratively. How important is this information, Tim Jansen? Well, it's about the strongest evidence you can have. It's, an, it's evidence from a family member of the defendants. So it has a credence of credibility. She had the ability to be there, to perceive it, to see it. Uh, it, co it. It corroborates what she was looking for or searching on her phone. They're probably going to get those phones and clearly show that they were communicating with each other. Um, and they probably, I think they got them by and going in the phone store and seeing them purchasing. And then they did the geo tracking on the phones to locate where they were to locate the bodies. So it all one nice little, little spider web. Um, that's what a conspiracy is, right? A, a little spider web, but a lot of pieces going different angles. But uh, mm -hmm. she's a very important witness in the case. I hope they have her under security. I hope they don't have her with a family member. I hope they have her in a foster home or somewhere to protect her. Um, we don't know how big this group is, how close this group is. But if you and I know what's happening, then members of that group know what's happening and they're going to be able to identify who that person was. Uh, how often do you change the sheets every time larvae are found on them is the answer. Uh, according to my wife, Nancy B says, be careful, Joel. Um, 
Dr. McCaleb is now like, please get me out of here. And now I'm starting to itch. But um, according to the affidavit, they talk about the morning of the disappearance, um, Michaela, and they say that the Twombly's, according to investigators, were going on a mission is the word they use on the morning of March 30th. The OSBI says that they arrived, uh, the, the Twombly's arrived back home around noon and told a relative to clean the pickup, like the sheets, but to clean the pickup truck that they had been in. The relative asked what, what happened and uh, was allegedly told um, this relative, this is assumed the daughter, and this is a quote, things did not go as planned but that it would not have to worry about her again, meaning Veronica Butler. Um, Michaela, this is, again, incredibly incriminating. Um, This is coming directly from who we believe is the Twombly's daughter. Um, What else do you think she knows if she knows all this? I think there's a lot. I I think it's very possible that, I mean, bringing five stun guns, and I can't remember the viewer, but, I mean, one of them, had mentioned, you know, that that's probably set for five people to be involved in it, which it uh, looks to be with Grice, perhaps. But I think that it was possible that they didn't plan to kill him and things just kind of uh, 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 got out of hand and got out of control or they uh, got started in it. And yeah, they didn't plan to kill him, but all of a sudden, I mean, maybe just scare him or or hurt him a little bit. And then it turned into murder and it went south like, like really quickly. And that's possible too. I mean, that's, that's totally possible. Do we know that? Well, yeah. I mean, they were planning murder back, back in February. (laughs) So, I mean, that's not a good sign for them because that, that does kind of hint to the pre premeditation thing, but, but I'll bet you that she knows quite, quite a bit because I've got four, four girls. I have a 16 year old, one of them, and they know, like even like the little kids, I mean, eight, seven, six years old, know and pick up on so much stuff that we never think that they do. I mean, stuff that we don't say directly to them, but they hear it, they just see an action, whatever, and they pick up on it. They're a lot quicker than we often give them credit for. Uh, indeed. Uh, Tim Jansen, a uh, good question here. Do you think these four or a multiple of them, maybe three, uh, will be tried together? Yeah, I think they would want to try them together if it's a small community. They don't have the resources to do multiple trials to get all these people here, get jurors. Um, thinking about that little 16-year-old, when I was a little kid, my my aunt, great aunt from Italy, she used to always say, little mules have big ears. Mm. That's what the little girl Cora is. <laughs> little mules have big ears. And it was so true. They see and they hear everything. Uh, and that's going to be part of their downfall. Mm. Um, Steve Peterson, moving right along with this affidavit, just a couple more things, and I promise we'll wrap. According to the affidavit, the Twombly's blocked the road to divert uh, both Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly to where Tiffany Adams, Tad Collin, the boyfriend, and another man were. This is where it gets weird. This other man is this, I, we believe it to be this Grice guy. Um, the relative asked, and again, this is a daughter, why Kelly had to die. And Cora Twombly allegedly said Jillian Kelly was not innocent because she had supported Butler. Um, and then the relative asked if the bodies were put in a well and Cora Twombly allegedly rep- replied something like that. I mean, this is, keep in mind, this is likely a mother talking to her 16-year-old daughter. I mean, that alone is is sickening. But what about, like, just the nonchalance here, Steve? I mean, they're talking about it. Like, yeah, she had to go because she supported her. Yeah, they ended up at a well, something like that. I mean, they're so nonchalant about this. You know, it's, what kind of scares me is it, you look at the verbiage they use. We're going on a mission. How many missions did they have prior to this? That it has a that it has a an adjective, you know. So, uh, do they use the term mission a lot? Uh, yeah. Uh, how would a sixteen-year-old daughter even think about? Did they put them down a well? Is this some, some, something they've done in the past? You you know what I mean. This these are the kind of questions I think of when I hear these kind of responses. Otherwise. You know, I mean, if I ask my kids about this, they wouldn't have a clue what any of this means. You know, I don't talk like this in my house. So you have to just imagine 
This is the kind of conversations that goes on a lot that a 16 year old can participate in and not feel like this was so strange or unusual. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of scary. Yeah, it's a good point. Really good point. Um, Jessica Souza, uh, they tried to stop the 16 year old of uh, Twombly's daughter from talking. And I guess it's uh, her daughter, not his necessarily from talking. Tad went into the house with a gun uh, and the police stopped them. Um, I don't know if that can be corroborated or not. Um, and then, Tim, this goes to you. Could this possibly be a federal case? They were brought over um, state lines. I don't know that they were brought over state lines or just the gra- I guess they traveled over state lines or just the gravity of the case. Is there any way to make this a federal case? Uh, oh, I think they can. I think if they I think they can. If they entice them, if they got the supervisor not to be there so they could execute this crime um, over state lines, they did it by a text messages or an email. Uh, anything. I mean, the federal jurisdiction is pretty easy to get. Um, and a creative prosecutor can find it. Did they buy the, would they buy the burner phones? Right. Um, yeah. they buy those, you know, a lot of ways you can find. And the good, the good thing about the feds is that the feds can take their time and they don't have, because they, you know, they can take it. If after the investigation is completed, they'll tell the state investigators, Hey, listen, we're going to take this. Now, usually in murder cases, they would allow the state to do it, especially if you have a death penalty. But the case you're doing tomorrow night, Joel, sounds like it should be the feds come in because mm. it sounds like the locals have c- cleaned it all up. You need yeah. the feds to get in there because that case does not sound like a suicide. No. And somebody did something and, and the federal people will be able to prosecute that. They won't have control over the feds. We're going to need to get uh, Tim Jansen uh, in on the Ellen Greenberg case as well. Um, This is one last little piece I want to cover. Then we'll get final thoughts here. Um, According to the affidavit, uh, they talk about fresh dirt. The person who owns the land where the dirt work was done says that Tad Cullum rents the pasture. So this is where the crime happened. Uh, The owner says Cullum asked on March 28th or 29th, so this presumably a couple of days before the murder, if he could cut a tree down, remove a stump, bury some concrete and do dirt work. The owner said Adams was with Cullum during the request. The owner gave Cullum permission. The landowner said Cullum did the work with a skid steer on March 30th. And the skid steer, I have no idea what that is. I'm from Jersey. And the skid steer was gone. What the hell is a skid steer? It was gone by noon. But again, Steve Peterson, do you know what a skid steer is? That's number one. And number two. I'm from Boston. (laughs) Why would I know that? (laughs) <laughs> but what I mean, it sounds like they're preparing a burial ground here. Um, again, the the witness testimony here is going to be critical. Um, but you as an investigator, and I mean you collectively, are they going back and speaking and re-speaking to these people at this point? Oh, absolutely. That, especially since the arrests have taken place. Because now, in theory, the main threat has been contained. And the people that were afraid of Granny and and our and our buddy there, the Duck Dynasty lookalike guy, you know, their their presence has been removed. So I think that some of the people on the periphery would feel less threatened coming in and cooperating. Hey, given a choice, I'd always rather be a witness than a defendant. And if there's any way to tie me into this thing, I want to get on the bus first, and I'll tell you everything you need to know to make sure that I get the best seat. Um, Michaela, there's a question here. Do you think that the Twombly's were being paid uh, by Granny and Tad here? And does that change the dynamic if, in fact, they were? I mean, it's possible. Um, but they were also all in the same group together and friends and of the same kind of a sovereign citizen mindset. In fact, uh, one of the viewers, Naughty Citizen asked, or I mean, Naughty Brunette asked if it was like, if being a sovereign citizen was passed down from generation to generation, and it most certainly is a lot of times. I mean, the, the parents of our sovereign citizen clients that we've had tend to be sovereign citizens themselves. <laughs> so whether through genetics or, or I mean, just through conditioning, but I would think, they were, yeah, it's possible that they were paid, but I'm not, uh, thinking that they necessarily were probably just out of camaraderie, fear, the group that they were in, uh, something like that. But you never know. Hmm. 
Um, final thing here. We talked about this a little, little bit at the beginning, but Coco uh, 5, which is the local Oklahoma City station, uh, they confirmed that Granny Adams has ties to the Oklahoma, Oklahoma Republican Party and was elected last year as the chair for Cimarron County for the GOP, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, the state senator, a guy named Nathan Dom, who's the chair of the Oklahoma Republican Party, uh, actually released a statement. I will read it now, and then we'll get final thoughts. This is a tragic situation with innocent children being at the center of this still developing situation. Well, more than a situation. While we at the Oklahoma Republican Party have no personal relationship, I like how he's trying to distance himself, or knowledge of the individuals who have been accused in this senseless crime, we have been we have been made aware that Miss Adams was previously elected by a handful of people to the role of chair in her county. We ask everyone to join us in praying for the family and most especially the children devastated by this horrible tragedy. Again, I think I asked you this earlier, Michaela, but how can you be a sovereign citizen and not believe in the government and yet be the chair of the Republican Party in your county? How does that square? Well, uh, firstly, as a member of the LGBT community, I would like to say that uh, Senator Nathan Dom can go to hell because because he is a terrible, <laughs> terrible person. Glad you said that. Yeah, I mean, just that's my exact feeling. And I dislike the, the guy with, with all my heart. So there. Um, being a member of the Republican Party, especially the chair and a sovereign citizen, complete hypocrisy. I mean, a lot of the sovereign citizens, I will say, are far right. And the Republicans, the MAGA, like the far right pre Republicans, that's kind of where their groups are. So that doesn't surprise me. Is it hypocritical? Absolutely. But not surprising because that's where they find their kinship, the the people that stormed the Capitol, the I mean the people that think just like they they do, that's kind of where they are. Except they're even further to the right. We have uh, found out that a skid steer is a small forklift, like a John Deere type thing. Yep, that's it. (laughs) There you go. Michaela helping us out there. Um, Steve Peterson always helping us out. I love when he's on. Great sense of humor, even uh, despite the dark nature of our stories. He was a special uh, senior special agent with the DEA. He helped bust the real Walter White uh, at the show Breaking Bad. Uh, Now he's having he's drinking to himself. He's having a toast to himself. Um, if you're not going to love yourself, who will Steve Peterson, where does this criminal investigation go from here? Steve? Well, I think they need to go. And I, I think there's a lot of interviews that need to be done. And I think, I think they've done a lot more than we have any idea of. And now that they got four people in custody, I think people will feel a little bit more comfortable speaking freely. I think they'll go back out and re-interview a lot of people They'll get the autopsy results. They'll create a timeline showing what happened and when it happened. And 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 now it's just a matter of crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and, and lining it all up to make a good story for the jury that they can understand. Hmm. Um, how hard will it be to get a jury in this area if they are sovereign citizens, Tim Jansen? They're going to have to have a change of venue. This is a small place. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um some sovereign citizens become sovereign citizens because they don't pay their taxes. They lose their land and they then they build up this resentment against the government. Then you have some sovereign citizens who try to hide their sovereign citizenship and try to blend in, like right, Miss Adams. Um, Steve, I want to tell you it's been a pleasure being on the show with you tonight. You you take me <laughs> back to many meetings with DEA agents where they always give nicknames to people. And I don't know if it's for you or for my clients, but they give nicknames to other co-defendants. And, and it just took me back to many years sitting in with my clients with the DEA. And it's been fun. Well, thank you. Same here, Tim. Same here. I appreciate that. And uh, fun to have Dr. Michaela Sarah Mosing on. She is the owner of the largest Oklahoma-owned private investigation agency. She's also a licensed process server, a private investigator a notary public, and she's also licensed to be a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent. She can literally do it all in the state of uh, Oklahoma. Uh, Lorna McKenzie saying, Tim, we appreciate you. We appreciate uh, Dr. Michaela. Uh, Dr. Michaela, I know you're going to have your ear to the ground on this. Uh, what are you expecting next? The hearing, next hearing is in a couple of weeks, but uh, I imagine 
we will have news breaking uh, before then. I absolutely do. I think that you're going to have, I mean, like it was mentioned by the other guests before, I mean, more, more people coming out of the woodwork. I think you're going to see uh, more about exactly the cause of death and the medical examiner once they get a little bit more time, because usually that takes, as the other experts know, I mean, f f uh, three to six months, but they've like really sped it up in this case. I think you're going to see a lot more of possible deals or who the attorneys are going to be and, and who the possible witnesses may, may be in the case. Um, it's going to get really interesting uh, really quick. It's going to be a real big show. Well, uh, please uh, get me, uh, if, if you're getting info, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, and uh, we'll be back on air with this story, of course, next week. A quick reminder, again, tomorrow night, please be here, not for me, but for the Greenberg family. Daughter stabbed 20 times, 10 to the back of the head, back of the neck, two post-mortem. Um, the uncle of the possible killer was a high-level judge in Philly. They cleaned the crime scene. They took phones. The case has never been investigated, never, ever been investigated. It goes all the way up to current uh, Governor Josh Shapiro, who is a then Attorney General, Steve Peterson, raising his hands in disgust, as I do uh, when I hear this story. And the family has spent well over a half a million dollars out of their pocket uh, to investigate this. And uh, they don't have that much money to keep doing it, although he was a dentist. He had a good job. Um, it is, uh, you know, they're retired and they need help. So please be here. Tomorrow night, again, not for me, but for them at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen, one of my favorite people. I caught up with him when he was uh, here in Miami. Guy drives the coolest car in the world now. Um, his father-in-law sadly passed, but uh, Tim has that car, and uh, that is a beautiful automobile. He spent um, five years as a federal prosecutor, and uh, Tim doesn't know this, but I spoke to some people, and uh, we are working behind the scenes to get you a Tim Jansen show regularly regularly on STS. So uh, we'll get that to you at some point, the minute uh, we can all take a collective breath. Um, greatness attracts greatness. Thank you, Vonda K. Great panel tonight. Tim Jansen, your final thoughts. Um, it, it's just sad. Every day we, we have another murder case, a, a, a tragic murder case. People are innocent. People are killed over the dumbest things. Um, and people doing these think they can get away with it. The good thing is modern technology. First it was DNA. Now it's all phones, pinging, geo tracking. It's made it really difficult for people to commit crimes. And while you can't bring the people back, we can get justice that there is no perfect crime anymore. No perfect murder. Uh, well said, as always, uh, Tim, masterful in the courtroom, masterful on the YouTube. Uh, an amazing panel again tonight. Thank you to Dr. Michaela, Dr. Steve Peterson, Dr. Tim Jansen. He should be a doctor, even though he's a lawyer. I am a doctor, Juris Doctorate. Yeah, there Juris you go. <laughs> Love you, America. This is my Geraldo. What is going on on my screen? Is that that's got to be a Space Coast thing? Um, anyway, love you, America. Love you, Boston. Love you, South Carolina. Love you. Tallahassee, Florida, and of course, love you, Oklahoma, Texas County, Oklahoma. These are the victims. Please keep them in mind. We will see you tomorrow night with the uh, Greenbergs and their attorney and Gavin Fish, 7 p.m. Eastern. Didn't mean to cut off Michaela. See you tomorrow night, everybody.